Hello everyone, this is Benjamin from the Zephyr project. Today, this week, we are releasing the new major version of Zephyr, version 3.4. One of the significant milestones that the project just passed is that there's now over 8,000 commits into the main Git repository, GitHub repo of the project, which uh, if you do the math, we do releases every four months. The project has been around for over seven years. So there's effectively tons of changes uh, between each release, right? And it can be hard to keep track. So you can certainly go through the wall and the full release notes, which are linked in uh, the description below. There is also a blog post that I've put together that highlights some of the uh, most notable features uh, and uh, changes in the release. The release notes are like the, the, the source of truth and the, the most extensive one. But uh, if you just care about the highlights, uh, just yeah, go through the blog post and or check out this video where I will try to demo and walk you through some of the uh, coolest changes um, and starting with some of the new boards that were added to uh, Zephyr. So in no particular order, and again, uh, there's dozens, so there, this is not meant to be an, uh, a complete list, uh, but I, I thought I would highlight some of the uh, most notable changes. One is the addition of the Arduino Giga R1, uh, which was released earlier this year, I believe sometime uh, in March, February or of March, or March of uh, 2023. And pretty much the same day it uh, was already supported in Zephyr. It is a very capable uh, dual core board. I think it's powered by uh, a chip from um, ST, ST Micro. And the, uh, yeah, this it's a dual core STM32H7. So plenty of processing power, plenty of um, connectivity and pins. I think it has audio as well. It has Wi-Fi. Uh, this is now supported in Zephyr. Um, something that has been around for uh, more time, uh, but only recently got added uh, to Zephyr is the Wii or Terminal from Seed Studio. Um, it's um, a typical uh, Cortex uh, M based um, device, Cortex M4, I believe. What is particularly interesting with this one it ha is that it has tons of um, interfaces, um, like an LCD display. It has uh, USB, of course, it has an SD card, it has Wi-Fi, uh, the LCD display, uh, maybe I just said that already, tons of inputs as well, like um, buttons and the, the typical groove connector from Seed, all that is now supported as well. So um, that's pretty cool. Uh, the MX chip uh, from um, the Microsoft Azure IoT developer kit that many people uh, uh, might be familiar with is also supported with, um, uh, again, LCD display, SD card reader, and so on. Some new dev kits from ST um, around their new uh, H5 um, SOC product line. So that's a Cortex M33 and the dev kit might or might not be available at the time of recording the video. It says available in June, uh, but yeah, check it out if you're interested in um, low power scenarios and you need Wi-Fi. Again, you need uh, to test um, interactions with um, uh, and graphical user interfaces with an LCD display. It has integration with ARM Trust Zone as well for um, security oriented kind of scenarios. Beagle Board Connect or Beagle Connect, uh, rather Beagle Connect Freedom. This one is um, also something that was added in, added in the past few months. The uh, dev kit is built around a, um, a chip from TI, a, a simple link CC. 1352, a Cortex uh, M4 uh, based here again. And the main um, selling point, I guess, of this one, and it's a great um, um, application for, for Zephyr, is uh, all things wireless. So Wi-Fi is one for sure, but also uh, sub gigahertz and um, 802.15.4 kind of scenarios. So like you want to do mesh, you want to do six low pan, uh, yeah, it's certainly a, a great option and um, now supported in Zephyr. But that's, um, yeah, I guess that's only for 
ARM-based uh, um, boards and SOCs. There's uh, there's more, and again, it's dozens of boards. We can uh, quickly go through the, the, the list after if, if, if we have time, but uh, just check out the full release notes. Uh, this one is an ARM64, 64, uh, 64-bit platform. It's based uh, uh, and built around a Cortex uh, A55, so dual core. Uh, there's also a Cortex M uh, coprocessor, which I'm I'm not sure it's supported in the uh, in the main upstream repo, but uh, yeah, super beefy platform uh, and supported in Zephyr as well. Uh, last but not least, uh, of the ones that I thought might be worth highlighting, um, support for the ESP32 S3 um, SOC uh, has been added to Zephyr and alongside this support, the um, um, dev kit, like the, the the typical dev kit for the SOC is also available. So if you care about uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, and the nice form factor that uh, the, the, the ESP32 dev kits typically have, uh, that might be of interest as well. So that's for the boards. Now, something else that's uh, really cool to see and I think it might actually be the first time there's that many new types of peripherals um, for which support has been added in uh, in a release. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the list. And we're going to go through all of them, uh, going through some samples, some uh, pointers to uh, relevant areas of the documentation. But in a nutshell, one way to look at this is... Um, Many of the peripherals that uh, that are now supported in Zephyr, you would typically find them in um, computers, like in laptops. When you build a, a laptop or like some kind of a single uh, board computer, there will be peripherals such as a, a disk where you store uh, data and your file system and so on. There will be um, some probes maybe on your motherboard to measure temperature or to control the charge of um, your battery, uh, potentially. Uh, and typically to talking and discussing with uh, such peripherals is something that might be done over SM bus. Uh, there might be real-time clocks, RTCs, for keeping track of the time when uh, the um, main board might not be powered and you use some kind of like coin cell battery for, for that. So yeah, all those uh, Peripherals you see here have been added. So again, in no particular order, but for the sake of the presentation, we're gonna start with uh, auxiliary displays. So auxiliary displays, and we are looking at the main uh, documentation page there. I guess we could have looked at the Wikipedia page as well to get a quick explanation, but in a nutshell, uh, auxiliary displays uh, are those uh, display uh, devices for which the way to interact with them is by means of sending text uh, rather than sending bitmaps and pixels. That makes it uh, way more convenient when all you care about is really just providing some kind of feedback to uh, the user in the form of text, right? And so the um, a, a typical uh, auxiliary display you would find on... Um, uh, you would find maybe on uh, old uh, or old-ish, um, uh, I don't know, uh, scales in your kitchen or like you, you see the kind of of the, of, um, of interface I, I'm talking about, right? So with Zephyr 3.4, auxiliary displays are now supported. That means a couple of things. One is you have a common API to interact with them, to send text, to um toggle maybe and to control the uh, backlight uh, of, of the displays and that also means that there's already a bunch of um, drivers that are supported so um, there's i think three drivers that are supported and we're going to see a quick demo uh, of the um, of the sample that you will effectively find if you search in the documentation or in the code for samples around auxiliary displays that's the one we're going to run. So let's uh, let's see. Let's switch to um, to a terminal. So what do we have uh, here? This is a uh, an STM32 dev kit, which is attached over I squared C to an auxiliary display. Uh, I think the, the um, so this guy over here. I believe this is from Seed Studio, and this is using one of the uh, chips that uh, for which there's now a driver in Zephyr. So 
what I can do is essentially just compile the um, official code sample uh, against um, my particular board and uh, and flash it, right? And maybe while this um, happens behind the scenes, we can uh, switch to um, the code, to, to Visual Studio Code, where um, I can briefly show you the only change I did to the official sample. It was, and it is, to add the device tree overlay for my particular uh, board design. In my case, I've attached the um, auxiliary display through I squared C. Um, so this is what the overlay says, right? I have an, an um, auxiliary display. It, it's uh, available through I squared C uh, address uh, 3E. And this particular display has 16 columns uh, times two rows. Uh, so that's 16 uh, by two characters, right? And uh, the code itself is just the sample code where uh, you get a reference to your device tree node, and then you can start using the um, auxiliary display APIs against it. So for setting the position of the cursor, uh, for writing some uh, some text, clearing the text, setting potentially the backlight on or off, this kind of stuff. So if we go back, um, yeah, flashing didn't work for some reason, sometimes it doesn't, but that's Good, because I can show it to you in real time. Let's try to flash again, flashing the board. And now it is displaying Hello World from Zephyr. It doesn't fit on the screen, but that's the idea. And going back to the code, we could um, just as a way to show you that the API can be really, really straightforward. I can um, call the backlight API against my device node. Here, the mode would be um, a code corresponding to what mode, uh, what backlight mode you want to switch to for this particular device and driver. Uh, this would effectively mean uh, red backlight. So saving, moving back, recompiling the code. We don't have to do a, uh, we don't have to do a clean build. We won't flash directly because sometimes it fails uh, for some reason uh, on, on this machine. So code has been compiled. Let's display this again, flashing. And there we go. Uh, so now it's harder to read the text, but it's there. Um, I I swear, let's see if I can, yeah, it's there. So that's for uh, auxiliary displays. Um, and yeah, feel free to try it out. There's already with the three, I believe, drivers that were added to the repo, uh, that's already if not the majority, a good chunk of the kind of auxiliary displays uh, you would find out there. And they're based on one of those uh, chips anyways. All right, so now moving on to other kinds of peripherals that are supported and not necessarily many demos for, for some of those, but just want to walk you through some of the documentation and relevant pointers. NVMe, if you care about talking and interfacing with uh, disks and VME disks, just like maybe uh, you've been using uh, SD card interfaces uh, in the past in a very, very similar way. You can do NVMe now. So uh, yeah, let's look maybe briefly at the documentation. So yeah, like I said, uh, accessing disks um, in the past, one thing that you may have already done is uh, um, using SD cards in your designs. So for talking and interfacing with an SD card. It's usually mostly just a matter of uh, setting things up in your device tree um, and uh, yeah, attaching, for example, it would often happen over uh, SPI, the com uh, communication with SD cards. Uh, this is how it would look like. Uh, similarly, maybe you would be using a, an emulated uh, flash uh, flash partition. Uh, that, that could be an option too. And now in a very, very similar way, you can do uh, NVMe and uh, just like you would attach your SD uh, card and SD controller to an SPI interface, you would do just the same uh, attaching your NVMe um, controller to a PCI Express node in your device tree. And that's, uh, yeah, that's essentially it. It might not be for everyone. I realize that not everyone will uh, want or need uh, an NVMe drive in their um, uh, embedded uh, designs, but for uh, people building embedded controllers, this is actually a really, really useful addition. Okay, now uh, retained memory. What does that even mean? Uh, the idea is that uh, sometimes you want your application 
to persist some information uh, and you want the information to be there when the application restarts uh, without necessarily uh, relying on uh, flash storage or like non-volatile um, memory. Um, you want the data to remain and to, to be retained as long as your um, chip and uh, is power, powered on, right? Things like um, you may be doing an update to your application and uh, once it restarts, it needs to remember some information, some data from uh, a previous life, right? And so for that, it might be overkill to store data in um, non-volatile areas. So with retained memories, you can effectively um, uh, describe and you have, um, so it's a, a new subsystem uh, alongside some drivers for uh, um, uh, for RAM, a non-allocated non RAM, for example, would be a typical driver that you could use. When you um, you set this up in your um, in your system, then you have effectively new partitions that you can use for storing data. And uh, let's yeah, let's briefly look at the doc uh, the documentation of how this looks like. All right, so this is the main documentation page for the retain the new uh, retention subsystem, and uh, yeah, it just. Uh, I guess I paraphrased uh, what, what it just says in terms of, uh, yeah, you want the stored data to not be persisted should there be power failure and you don't want it to be stored in flash or this kind of, of, kind of memory, uh, but still you want uh, to share information between different applications or, or uh, for a given application uh, and you want the inform information to be there when the app restarts. So that's what the retention subsystem does. And oftentimes uh, it will be as simple as setting up um, a dedicated uh, region in your in your memory uh, if if you care about doing this uh, in uh, using RAM as, as your uh, backend. Uh, and as soon as you set up this kind of a retained memory uh, section, then you can effectively do things like creating partitions. So in this case, it looks like the, the, the sample and the documentation hints at having two partitions, one being um, 256 bytes and the other being slightly larger. Uh, and what uh, you may be able to configure are things like um, having a dedicated prefi prefix uh, or, or checksums that make it easier to detect when data may have been corrupted, right? You thought that you would have uh, retained some information, but you may be able to detect when it got corrupted. And uh, uh, I mean, this is the kind of uh, higher level of functionality that the retention subsystem provides. You could do that manually, uh, but with uh, with the retention subsystem, you have uh, something that's way more portable and you don't have the headaches of uh, manipulating everything yourself. Moving on to SMBus. SMBus, you may or may not be familiar with it. Uh, you may be more familiar with SMBus than I am, but in a nutshell, it's a... Um, a variation of I squared C, the I squared C standard, which uh, oftentimes would be find uh, would be found in um, for inter interacting with um, sensors and peripherals on um, on the motherboard or on or like in in uh, in a PC uh, talking to the kind of temperature probes you would find uh, on, on various chipsets, uh, talking to the uh, getting information such as fan speed or uh, getting information from and talking to uh, fuel gouges to control uh, the battery charge of, um, of a laptop, for example. Oftentimes this would uh, happen over SM bus. So yeah, this is now supported. So um, that, that, that could be a pretty, uh, pretty neat if you want to, to, to support that, uh, if you need that in your design. Uh, and now last but not least, in terms of new peripherals that are supported, um, real-time clocks are now first class citizens in um, Zephyr. Uh, you may already know what that is. Um, typically uh, it's a small, I see that you would um, power, it's really low power and you would oftentimes, just like we actually see here on, on, the, on the image, uh, you would use a coin cell battery to uh, power it. Uh, like even when your main design is powered off, the real time clock uh, keep tracks of time. Like you set it once and for all, ideally you set the, the date and time, um, you synchronize with the time server or whatever. And then th this chip will keep track of the information it may also actually um, allow you to um, to set up some alarms, like you want 
independently from uh, the rest of your design, independently from your actual software, actually. Uh, you have a, a dedicated how you have a dedicated hardware chip that will do the job for you of tracking time and sending you, feeding you with interrupts uh, when um, an alarm uh, gets triggered. So uh, yeah, let's look briefly at the documentation and at a demo. All right, so yeah, really briefly before jumping into the, the, the actual demo, um, there's a new API now to abstract out uh, the interaction with um, common RTC um, chips. And yeah, essentially the way it will work is that you will want to do things like setting an alarm time. You will want to do things like um, uh, yeah, getting a callback uh, whenever um, uh, some operations on the RTC have been successful. You may want to calibrate it. Uh, and uh, obviously <laughs> some of the maybe most important features are setting the time, getting the time. For all those APIs, what you will have noticed is that they actually manipulate um, uh, time structs, right? Like the, it, it's really all about time uh, as opposed to more uh, abstract or hardware dependent notions. And uh, yeah, let's look uh, quickly at the uh, at a demo. I couldn't put my hands on RTC um, uh, break breadboards and, and, and breakout boards um, in my drawers, but that's actually a good news because that's an excuse for me to show you how uh, to use the, um, the emulated RTC driver that was contributed together with the new API. Okay, so we're gonna, like, is, this is gonna be a super quick demo. Uh, I don't think there is a, an, like, an official sample for RTC API because it's like really straightforward. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna tweak the existing Hell World sample um, and we're gonna run it against the um, native POSIX emulation for, for Zephyr. So just taking a minute here to uh, to walk you through it briefly because it's actually really powerful. We're gonna use it in, in a moment for um, another demo, but essentially, if you don't have hardware uh, at hand, or if you want to like save some time and save some run trips to test your Zephyr applications, uh, the native POSIX is a really interesting target. And uh, what we can see um, is that somewhere down the um, the list of um, devices available from this um, fake board, if you will, is a, an RTC um, an RTC device, right? And it's using the RTC emulated driver, but we don't care. Like what we want to do uh, in the context of the demo uh, is that we're going to interact with this RTC device to uh, do some time related stuff. So one thing that we're going to do and tweak is the existing um, Zephyr Hello World sample. So like Typically, if you look at everything but the green additions that I've um, uh, did, typically it would just print Hell World on the screen. Uh, for the sake of the demo and showing you how the API looks like, I've uh, changed a few things. Um, handling of the her errors in the code uh, might not be ideal. Uh, it might be missing a few um, here and there, making sure that those uh, operations work uh, um, and return uh, correct results. But just for the sake of the demo, please uh, uh, just close your eyes on, on that one. Um, yeah, what, what do we do? We just need to get a reference to our RTC device uh, using uh, device tree and then the the good old uh, device DT get macros. Then we want to interact with the uh, RTC. So we're going to do, this is going to be a two-step process. One is we're going to pretend that when the application starts, we're setting the time to uh, 12 o'clock, like 12 o'clock uh, sharp, uh, 12 zero zero. Um, and then we're going to effectively set the time. We're going to wait for some time for five seconds or so. And then we're going to ask the RTC Hey, please, what time is it? Uh, and then we are going to get that info. Uh, and yeah, that's essentially it. And running the code is as simple as building the code against uh, the uh, native PO6 um, uh, target. So yeah, in my case, it's already been built. I believe, uh, uh, yeah. I hope you trust that uh, it's, it's exactly the same code that we're going to run. And running the code will be as simple as running the compiled binary. It actually runs on my machine uh, and it does what I thought um, it would do and what I hope you had anticipated it would do. Uh, we had paused for five seconds, so the time 
uh, at the time of logging, the time is five seconds past noon uh, or past 12. So that's, um, that's for RTCs. Um, something else, a new subsystem uh, has been introduced. Uh, so retention subsystem, we briefly talked about. Um, this one now is the input subsystem. What it does is that it provides an API for dispatching input events from input devices to the application. Uh, one thing that often happens when you build some kind of embedded solution is that you will have buttons, touch screens, this kind of stuff that generate some kind of low event, um, low level kind of uh, events, uh, almost like interrupts, right? You would have, you would detect um, that a particular um, general purpose input um, has uh, switched because um, a button was pressed, that kind of stuff. But that doesn't necessarily mean a lot or doesn't necessarily mean enough for you in terms of like, what does this mean for your application? How should you react to um, a particular GPIO uh, detecting an input? Like it might not even be a real uh, input because you want to debounce your buttons in your application. It's not going to be about a GPIO 43 uh, that got pressed. It's going to be about someone pressed button A or button B sort of stuff. So bringing this level of abstraction and uh, thinking about input events as actual input events, as opposed to uh, more low level stuff, is exactly what the new input subsystem does. Um, it effectively integrates really well with the existing GPIO keys um, uh, functionality. It already integrates really well with the existing um, uh, keyboard uh, case scan APIs for, uh, for Zephyr. So we're gonna see yeah, briefly, a demo of how should you have some kind of um, graphical user interface that you want to build, what does it mean and what does it change uh, for you? We can actually look at, at the code uh, of, uh, of, of the main code sample. Uh, what it does is like it's meant to be run on a board that has some kind of inputs. Potentially, I think yeah, here the overlay that's been provided is, oh yeah, should you be running on the NRF52 developer kit? Let's pretend that whenever we press button zero, this fires an actual application event, input event uh, corresponding to in input key zero, et cetera, et cetera. And then what the sample does is that it would, like whenever this kind of stuff happens, it would show it to you. So. Here, like this is where all the magic happens, right? There's only just one callback that's super easy to uh, declare in your code that you need to um, to have, and that's where your application will be notified of input events in your um, in your system. So one yeah one way to show you um, that it's it can be actually more than just buttons is that I want to show you this in the context of a more complex graphical user interface where a touch screen is involved. So again, we're going to use um, native POSIX emulation because one thing that the native POSIX emulation has is that it has a uh, fake uh, touch screen um, and it has also a fake uh, LCD display, which is uh, yeah, somewhere else. Uh, where is it? Yeah, SDLDC. So that would be, um, we have a 30, um, 320 pixel by 20, 240 pixel uh, fake display. So the demo that I'm going to run is going to be the um, typical, uh, I mean, the default LVGL demo that's available in Zephyr. And uh, yeah, let's effectively just run it. Uh, so let's build the, um, the demo. Okay, uh, just like before, we now have a, a binary, um, uh, an executable uh, available in our build uh, folder, and we're going to run it. Whoops. There we go. Uh, so this is running LVGL. By the way, if you're not familiar with LVGL, just check it out, because what you see here in the middle of the screen is an actual like button that you can easily create using the API. You don't have to like, draw it by hand. Uh, so that's, um, yeah, that's pretty cool. And uh, there's some kind of counter right here. What happens if I start clicking on the button or click clicking on anywhere on the screen rather? 
Well, we have some traces uh, in um, in the main console behind uh, the, 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 the window here where all the input events are being logged, right? And that's, wh why is that? Well, essentially what I did is that I tweaked the main uh, LVGL sample and just like before for the the hello world just look at the uh, the changes right so everything here is the default lvgl uh, sample application it would create uh, it would configure the screen it would create some buttons blah 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 the only thing i did is that i um, borrowed the uh, the code from the uh, input subsystem demo and yeah the only thing that i want is my application to um, let me know and to start logging all the events which is now what's What's being done, right? Whenever a new input is detected by the input subsystem, is being forwarded to the input subsystem, I can log it, or rather, I would do something useful, right? And one thing that I would like to call out, uh, we don't have a sample for that, but I think someone should build it. Maybe I should build it, or you should build it, um, is to sort of build uh, a bridge between this, having a graphical user interface, that reacts reacts to touch uh, events, etc., and the Zephyr State Machine Framework, which I believe not enough people know about, but there is in Zephyr a um, a way to easily uh, create state machine uh, and actually execute uh, state machines and execute them, right? And that would be really convenient for creating a UI where you want to. Um, disable a particular um, set of menus or buttons depending on uh, whether such or such event um, has occurred or not. And so like, yeah, um, changing the state of your UI um, uh, through and, and uh, with the, the help and the support of the state machine framework can be actually really, really powerful and can make your UI easier to test, easier to um, uh, to develop independently of any hardware choices that you might be making in terms of what is it that's going to drive uh, and generate inputs in your system. So yeah, long story short, um, check out not only the input subsystem, but potentially the state machine framework as well. Okay, switching gears. I think we are more or less done with uh, things that have um, to do with the actual hardware, either like talking about new SOCs, new uh, supported um, types of boards, peripherals, blah, blah, blah. Uh, one thing that's really worth highlighting is some changes being done to uh, what can be achieved uh, when using the uh, Zephyr Twister uh, testing framework. Uh, so like this is something that Zephyr uses a lot internally sort of like as an open source project to test all the features all the like testing the kernel all the subsystems etc this is all powered by uh, twister anytime someone does a pull request to the zephyr repo there's literally hundreds of um, um, tests and, and test suits and test cases that are being uh, run one thing that's now possible is to use, um, um, like there's a better and, and more powerful integration with PyTest for writing your actual tests using uh, the PyTest um, testing framework. Similarly, uh, you may want to use uh, the robot, uh, robot framework. So it essentially depends on where you're coming from in terms of what um, scripting language you're comfortable using. Like PyTest obviously would be using Python. Robot Framework is more like a, a DSL, a domain-specific language, but it has um, some benefits, especially if you want to use something like Renode for um, tapping into emulated hardware. This could be a, a good one. Uh, I think actually really briefly, we could look at um, yeah, one such yeah, a sample of uh, using um, a Robot uh, Framework for writing a test. Say you want to test whether your um, shell behaves correctly, then using robot framework, it would be something like um, instructing the framework to prepare uh, your machine, starting an emulation, and then waiting for a particular something to appear on the UART, and then writing something to the UART, like the version command, for example, and then waiting again for a particular um, output. So yeah, that would be the kind of... Um, level of uh, flexibility you get with the robot framework DSL, or you could also um, use uh, G, G test, Google test, which um, 
something or originating from uh, Google, obviously, but that many people are using for C, C++ um, uh, extensive test suites. One, uh, yeah, one last word uh, about like the kind of things that you may be able to achieve with the, those all those additions. Um, I mean, there's you can you will start finding some uh, test suites within Zephyr itself that are um, uh, leveraging any of those additional frameworks uh, and. I mean, to, to my point, actually, uh, one such uh, test, which I wanted to briefly walk you through, is is not part of the main Zephyr repo just yet, but will um, hopefully soon be. Uh, it, it shows, um, I think, yeah, it's a great example of uh, the kind of things that you may be able to accomplish. It's meant to demonstrate, um, or it's meant to actually test uh, a um, the interaction between a Zephyr-based uh, device and a lightweight M2M server. So lightweight M2M without going into the details would be a, a protocol for doing device management like over the air uh, firmware upgrades of devices and whatnot. And so there is a, um, a UDP based communication um, UDP IP based communication between the um, lightweight M2M server and the lightweight M2M Zephyr based device. And so Usually, when you want to test the functionality, you would need to control both sides of the story, right? You would need to uh, to check if doing something on the device side has the expected effect on the server side, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's effectively what's being done uh, with this uh, test suite. It's um, setting up the um, so the um, the instrumented and the tested device is is uh, being uh, interacted with through a, a shell uh, interface, right? And so whenever you want to instruct the tested device to do something, you would send uh, commands uh, over uh, over UART, essentially. And the interaction with the lightweight M2M server will be done by means of um, interacting with the uh, APIs, the, the like the REST APIs of the server. And then what happens is that you can start testing that everything works uh, like it should uh, by starting to do things like telling your device, hey, please, Mr. Device, this is how I want your local lightweight M2M um, device tree to look like. Uh, I'm setting up uh, yeah, some, um, turning some flags on or off and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm effectively, once this is done, I check if everything has been reflected uh, correctly on the um, server side, right? And so this is the kind of end-to-end -end scenario that you can uh, start um, implementing and modeling in your in your test suite, thanks to the latest changes in uh, Twister. Okay, uh, this one uh, will be probably pretty quick. Uh, it, it doesn't sound like much, but it's actually really, really powerful. It's called Snippets. It's uh, an extension to uh, to the Zephyr meta build system and an extension to, to, to West to allow you to easily create once and for all a set of, um, to, to capture all the settings that you may um, want to apply to a particular um, application slash device um, without, yeah, like usually you would copy paste things from one app to the other, like, yeah, you always end up enabling some, um, you, set, you set some log levels uh, to debugging for some subsystems that you want to debug, you um, enable the Zephyr shell, you do, yeah, a bunch of things, you, um, you mount some specific peripherals, whatever. Uh, with the snippets, you can actually capture that. And just like an a, an overlay on steroid, uh, if you will. Um, so that's um, that's the idea. It's very well documented and there's even a, a sample in the, in the repo. So I don't think I need to necessarily run the sample, but uh, the way a snippet is being defined is by means of capturing in the YAML file the uh, different um, uh, files uh, for which uh, you want to uh, like that are part of the snippet and that you want to potentially apply to a particular application so here we have in the same snippet uh, some device tree overlays that enable um, uh, a, a UART console over USB over USB um, CDC and we have also very related and very relevant settings for effectively enabling uh, a UART console uh, over this particular um, USB um, uh, USB interface. And once you have 
defined. And once you have this snippet, either uh, like one of the snippets that are, avail that are available upstream in Zephyr or some snippet that you have may have in your own um, source tree, then um, you can effectively just decide that whatever build, uh, whatever app that you want to build, you may decide that there are um, a bunch of snippets that you want to apply. And that makes it really, really easy to uh, reuse some, um, yeah, again, like for troubleshooting and debugging, this can be uh, really convenient and prevent you to copy pasting too much. All right, again, really quickly for this one, but uh, when you go through setting up your development environment for Zephyr, one thing that you will end up doing is uh, downloading and installing the Zephyr SDK, which will bring you all the uh, tool chains and all the, like, all the host tools that you may need for um, building your apps and flashing your apps on ARM, Extensa, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, one notable change, uh, so it's, I highly recommend that you update to the latest version of the Zephyr SDK, which would be uh, 0.16.1. Uh, that's the link. Uh, I mean, the instructions in the documentation will uh, tell you to install uh, this SDK anyways. And one uh, not worthy change. Um, so you can go through the uh, the whole release notes. Um, uh, and actually, you could go through the release notes of uh, 0 0.0 as well. Um, but yeah, one, one thing that's changed between the previous version, 15.2 and 16.1, uh, is um, that now downloading the SDK, um, the, the, the packaging format is way more efficient. It would be using um, tar um, XZ on uh, Linux and OS, uh, Mac OS uh, file, um, uh, operating systems, and it would be using 7-zip as opposed to zip in the past for Windows. So where in the past downloading 15.2 uh, for say uh, Windows would have been yeah close to two gigabytes. Now with 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.16, 0 or 0 0.16.1, the same uh, SDK, well, actually it's not the same, it's probably even uh, larger in that uh, it includes more than what was in 15.2 at the time, but it's uh, it's now effectively smaller, right? So that's, uh, it's still big, like we realized that it might take you several minutes depending on your connection, but hopefully you don't have to do that very often. And uh, yeah, we hope that this will improve the first time uh, sort of impression and experience when uh, setting up Zephyr for the first time. Okay, uh, yeah, something else is around Bluetooth. You may or may not know that Zephyr is really, really active and really strong for all things Bluetooth. Unfortunately, I don't have a really good um, setup and the required hardware at home to show you, um, to demo some of the cool stuff that's been added. But if you have uh, some uh, Bluetooth capable boards yourself, uh, please check out like the samples um, uh, corresponding to all the features that I'm gonna uh, briefly enumerate because uh, they are actually really, um, uh, yeah, the samples are very complete. So yeah, Zephyr is really strong when it comes to um, to Bluetooth. Bluetooth 5.4 specification was recently released, I believe uh, beginning of uh, February, 2023. And uh, most of the features that have been added are already supported in Zephyr. So things like, um, uh, the notion of using, um, uh, of doing, um, so it's called power, right? So it's uh, the ability to do periodic advertising with responses uh, for scenarios like, and it goes hand in hand with um, encrypting the information as well uh, for uh, scenarios like electronic shelf like labels. Um, this is uh, this is really useful. Uh, you remain low power and yet you can broadcast uh, useful information and advertise useful information uh, and get um, acts and replies as well so yeah that's uh, that's power there's uh, a bunch of things related to um, bluetooth mesh so essentially um, um, adapting the and um, updating the apis uh, and and the implementation to uh, align pretty much with almost the latest version of the mesh protocol um, uh, working draft, uh, 1.1 1 .1, uh, um, uh, revision uh, 18. And together with that, uh, you would have support for uh, uh, binary uh, objects, remote provisioning, like all that kind of stuff. 
uh, what else for uh, Bluetooth? A lot of audio related stuff. Uh, so the uh, common audio profile. So you can do um, uh, unicast and uh, broadcast as well. Um, and you have the dedicated samples for that as well. For the telephony, uh, the TMAS profile, so telephony and media audio services, um, this has been added as well. I mean, there is a lot. Uh, Bluetooth might not necessarily be my specialty, so that I don't want to uh, um, uh, say things that would be wrong. Please check out like all the samples, like Bluetooth might be uh, the area of the, of the Zephyr documentation when where you have uh, most samples. Um, I'm clicking too too quickly here, but uh, yes. Um, so whatever we just mentioned, right? The uh, Unicast, um, Unicast, uh, the telephony mobile stuff, the uh, periodic advertising, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all there. Um, just check it out, uh, try it out, um, and um, yeah, that's for Bluetooth. And with that, uh, I think this is pretty much all I had. Should I have forgotten anything, uh, it's not too late to uh, chime in in the, uh, in the comments in the video or um, on, on social media and so on. Please uh, yeah, make sure to stay in touch with the community. So the community is obviously really active on Discord, as uh, many of you maybe already know. If you don't know, just uh, head over to chat.zephyrproject.org and join the community. Uh, join our website as well. Subscribe to the newsletter. And uh, we'll talk more at the Zephyr Developer Summit at the end of the month. So that is if you're watching the video once, um, right when it's being released. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will see you for Zephyr 3.5 and for the next version in a few months.